This is Journeys with Ryan Frank. Conversations about culture and the issues affecting First Nations people in BC. Brought to you by Prince Rupert Port Authority. Linking a world of opportunity. Online, rupertport.com. Good evening. Welcome to Journeys. I'm your host, Ryan Frank, and we're on your nation, your station, CFNR. Oh, on tonight's episode of Journeys, I have Dr. Shannon McDonald. Now, she is uh, Métis and Anishinaabe, and she's from the Red River Valley in Manitoba, and she is the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for the First Nations Health Authority. Now, she comes on, and I talk to her a little bit about her background in medicine, but also we talk about what is the First Nations Health Authority doing about this COVID-19 uh, outbreak and what type of messaging they want to get out uh, to the people because I think it's important you hear from experts like Dr. McDonald. Uh, she is very uh, experienced and skilled in uh, medicine and community medicine. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. So let's get right to it. Here is my conversation with Dr. Shannon McDonald, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for the First Nations Health Authority. I'm Shannon McDonald, and I'm the Deputy Chief Medical Officer at the First Nations Health Authority in BC. Well, welcome to Journeys, and thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. I know you are not very busy right now, are you? <laughs> no, not at all. That little COVID-19 thing, just something off the end of my desk. Oh, man. <laughs> and you know, one of the things, I, I do like to have a little bit of humor involved in this, because I think that's the First Nation thing. I'm First Nation, you're First Nation, but I don't want people to think we're not taking stuff seriously, because we seriously, we definitely are. I know I am, and I know FNHA is for sure. Uh, no, absolutely. Yeah, so I want to talk to you about what FNHA is doing, but before I get to that, I'd love to talk uh, to you a bit about yourself so I know uh, more about you. So you are, is it Métis in Anishinaabe? I am. I grew up mostly in Winnipeg. Um, my mother was from areas south of that. My dad's roots are in southern Ontario, so there's a, a little bit of everything there. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But um, I grew up mostly in the city okay. uh, with, an, with an extended family. Okay, yeah. okay. Now, what was your uh, academic journey like? Now, I, did, I was reading a bit, of, <laughs> about, about, uh, a bit about it, and it sounded like you got your, uh, I think you were a bit older when you got your medical degree, right? I did. I graduated medicine the year I turned 40. Oh, uh, man. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thanks. I had done a whole lot of things, and at the time I started back to university, I was actually working at Canada Safeway, and um, I was a cashier for a while, and I worked in the bakery for a while, and then I was a customer service manager for a while, so it, I, I've kind of done all that. Um, I had three young kids at the time, and when I went back to university, um, I didn't even dare say the word doctor. Like, that wasn't even in my brain. Um, but I was lucky to be part of the University of Manitoba Access Program. Um, they've changed over time, but they still absolutely changed my life um, and gave me an opportunity to have some financial supports and academic supports and, and a community of people um, who are still my friends today. And that was, oh, God, I hate to say this, back in 1991. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It seems like uh, time just speeds up as you get older. I mean, uh, I, I can barely remember my 30s, it seems like. They were so quick. And then the 20s, I just was, don't even ask me about my 20s. It's like, geez, I don't even remember that. But I mean, that's that's an amazing story, uh, Shannon. I mean, did you? so you never even set, thought of the word doctor, but you were able to well, do that. That's pretty amazing. It was sort of like, you know, when you're a kid and you think about being a rock star, yeah. Right? Or, or whatever, being in the movies, it, it was just this dream. I <laughs> yeah. knew I was a smart kid, but so many things in my life made it challenging. And uh, not to mention three young kids. Yeah. Um, and so it just didn't seem possible. But I sat in classrooms with people who were 15 years younger than me and realized that my life experience, that 15-year gap, yeah. had taught me so much. And it really, I could bring all of that. Um, it had been a long time since I had done math or sciences. <laughs> yeah. So it was a bit of a journey that way. But being part of an academic community with the access program really helped. 
and um, we all pushed each other through it. It was uh, it was a really good time in my life. So Shannon, okay, now you need to answer this question for me because I was in university and I looked at medicine for a little bit, but I was I was there on an on a athletic scholarship, so playing sports and doing school was so difficult to balance and then trying to add medicine, which is like labs and tutorials and lectures. But you would have to do like serious math, like chemistry, biology. Yep. You did all of that? Yep. <laughs> oh my God. That's crazy. That, that was, that's an amazing story right there. So, I mean, and then the other thing too, because you went on, I mean, once you graduated from medicine, what did you specialize in uh, after that? Well, when I first got out of medicine, I chose to study psychiatry, and I did that for a couple of years, and then decided it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I had gotten into it thinking that I could serve First Nations communities as a psychiatrist, but what I was being trained to do was very hospital-based, very medication-based. Oh, yeah. And it, it didn't fit with my idea of wellness and what we needed to do for people's biopsychosocial spiritual wellness. And it was just, it wasn't a good fit. Yeah, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just, I took some time off. I was off for about six months. Um, and then I went back and, and re-entered residency in the population and public health community medicine world and found where I belonged. Okay, okay. Because I know you spent uh, at least things five years as the executive director for Aboriginal Health at the BC Ministry of Health. But you did say something there just uh, kind of in my mind that makes me think about like medicine and just the whole clinical aspect of it. And I, I was reading a bit about you and you were talking about just some of the systemic discrimination that you talked about when you mm -hmm. were when you're in medicine and I, you also talked about uh, I think just recently talking about changing the words that medicine is using even around this COVID-19 response and, and right. Try, right and trying not to to trigger say residential school survivors especially but I think just anybody that's uh, a little bit hesitant about our medical system even you know or even this their own health but I'd like to know more about the systemic racism or discrimination that you were experiencing and that you were talking about that I was reading. Well, it was an interesting thing. While I was studying medicine, and of course you do a lot of work as a, as a medical student, as an intern, and later as a resident in the hospitals, and uh, I studied in Winnipeg, and most of my training was at Health Sciences Centre, uh, so in downtown Winnipeg, where about 60% of the population um, that that hospital serves are Indigenous people. But nonetheless, there were always, you know, little comments in the background, people being dismissed yeah. uh, when they, they talked about their pain or how an injury or an illness was impacting them or, you know, what they would have to deal with when they got home. Uh, for me, one of the, the kind of life-changing moments, I was doing a, a family practice uh, we, we had an opportunity to do rural community family practice work, and I traveled with a doc um, to the community of Barron's River on the, the east side of Lake Winnipeg and um, was working in the nursing station and doing the doctor thing, and then at the end of the day decided I was going to go for a walk, and, and the nurses said, well, while you're going, can you go drop in? And, and this description only fits when you're on the reserve. The third blue house past the big tree. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about right now. That's amazing. So, yeah. yeah you, you go there and you check on the lady that's there. She's back after surgery. And, you know, here's some dressings. And if you could go do that, that would be really helpful because they were busy. So off I went, being a hero. I'm, you know, super doc. And I, I get there and... The house, it's winter. The house had plastic over the windows. Some of the windows were broken. Oh, my um, goodness. The door didn't close properly. And when I got in the house, there was like an old oil barrel that was being used as a wood stove to heat the house. And this lady was on a mattress in a back room. People had left food and water for her and something so she could relieve herself. But she had had an amputation. She could hardly move, never mind get up off this mattress off the floor and be able to function. And I was 
I mean, I spent time with her and we had a cup of tea and I did what I had to do. Then I went back to the nursing station and I was just, I was so blown away. So how did that happen? And the nurses said, it happens all the time. Huh. Doctors write, write discharge orders and they send people home, but they have no idea what the services are that are available in community or what the housing is like or what support systems are like. And I know that's not universal. That's not everywhere. Yeah. But, but it just, it changed what I wanted to do. It changed the fact that as a, a doctor, my, my biggest role is as a communicator yeah. to listen and to speak the truth. And uh, those kinds of experiences really changed how I wanted to work and what I thought I could do. I often tell my medical colleagues when they're bragging about their patient loads of a thousand people or 1500 people, I have 160,000 people who are my patients. And it's my responsibility to make sure they get the best care they can. Um, and I know that the problem started long before me, and the problem will be here long after I retire. But if I can change a few minds and hearts on the way, then that's what I'm here for. Oh, man, that uh, description. I, I, I can imagine that would change your perspective on life, really, seeing some, something like that. and. I did see something you said that your uh, your husband is a pretty sarcastic dude, and uh, you were like, maybe I think you were maybe getting some care yourself, and when doctors were getting snippy with you, then you would call you he'd call you doc or something like that. No, well, he does that all the time. Actually, if I'm being followed around in a store, yeah, yeah, which we all know happens, or you know, out in public where people are kind of giving me the eyeball, um, and he'll call me doc. Like he's just to see people's reactions oh man and you know yeah. I, there's people that i've talked to that are non first nations they're like i don't see that stuff happening i'm like you're the deputy chief medical officer and you're getting treated like this like come on give me a break people you know what i mean well that's when i pull the doctor card out <laughs> yeah. it, you know it's it's like here i am i may be dressed in sweats and a t-shirt and going to the garden center down the road from my home but i'm still somebody of value and everybody that walks in your door has the same value yeah. whether or not they have doctor in front of their name yeah that's so true i mean I, i've been involved in like economic development and i've met with like ceos of co big companies and stuff like that and you know I, I just i don't really treat those people differently than anyone else you know i, I need to meet them and see if they if they carry themselves with respect do they respect other people you know i think respect is earned it's not given you know what i mean and, I mean, I worked in government before I came to BC. Uh, I worked for First Nations Inwood Health Branch uh, in Manitoba and in Ottawa. And when I first got there, I was scared. I thought, you know, these directors general and ADMs <laughs> yeah. and all these titles, you know, like those people can judge me. And, and then I met them and they're just people. Yeah, exactly. They're, yeah. they're smart people. They're hardworking people, no doubt. But they're just people. Yeah. Um, and that that really changes how you approach things. Definitely does. Well, that's a really cool story. I'm glad that you are in your position now because you bring a, a different perspective than someone else that's uh, that never been on a reserve, never worked with First Nation people, not First Nation themselves. I think you just have a better understanding of some of the issues that some of the people that you're going to encounter, or your doctors and your in your in the health authority are going to be working with. I mean. That's that's pretty awesome that you're there. So, how long? Well, thank you. Yeah, how long have you been in uh, your role as deputy chief medical officer? Well, I joined First Nations Health Authority five years ago, um, and when I first took the job, it was this job didn't exist. I came in as the senior medical officer for Vancouver Island, um, but over time, poor Dr. Evan Adams was kind of here by himself when they hired me. Um, and they decided he needed a little more help centrally. So I kind of took on more and more and more, and then they created this position, um, and I was the successful candidate. So I, I am thrilled with that. And I had been part of the negotiations um, to develop the First Nations Health Authority. That was the reason I had come to BC to begin with, okay. because that work was being done. And I had an opportunity to take an active role in all of that. So coming here 
was just a progression from that process. Okay, so now that was that a very daunting task to you at first, or was it just something really exciting to you to to build something from maybe the ground up? Knowing this is going to be on the radio, I can't say the right words, but <laughs> yeah, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, well, well, that's that's amazing. I think your story is fantastic. I think you're a true role model for people. I mean, just thinking that you were, uh, you know, working in Safeway, and then before you went back to school to get your 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 education, it's pretty awesome. Just to make that decision is scary in itself. Walking into a classroom, I can only imagine. But it's kind of funny now because it's maybe even ironic a little bit because I look at grocery store workers a lot differently today than I did even, say, 10 days ago or to, or a week yeah. ago, you know, with this whole COVID-19 stuff. I feel like those workers are putting themselves out there. I mean, that's just grocery store workers, but our entire supply chain, but not to mention our doctors and our nurses that are out there working countless hours every day. I'd love to let let's I'd love to start talking about FNHA now and and what they're doing about this COVID-19 response and maybe what it was like uh let's start with how you guys first heard about this and what you first started to do when it initially was becoming an issue. Well, we have a, a really unique partnership with the provincial health authorities, um the provincial health officer Dr. Bonnie Henry and previous to her Dr. Perry Kendall and we had that relationship since we began, since we were being developed. So we've been part of the discussion with all of the regional medical officers and others in the province, and we have partners in the federal system as well. So we were well aware um, in New Year's Eve when China started talking about this new um, outbreak of pneumonia uh, in Wuhan, China. So from that time, as a public health physician, your ears perk up. I was a resident when SARS hit. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I've kind of been down this road. We were part of the H1N1 response uh, in 2009. So when you start hearing about things like, hmm, this is a pneumonia, nobody knows what it is, it's spreading quickly, it's badly affecting people, It, you know, we, we trained for this our whole careers. And you start thinking, okay, well, this could be an outbreak. And then, hmm, it starts going to Iran and to Italy. And, yeah. oh, now now we're getting close to pandemic. And knowing the global travel cycles, I mean, I heard the prime minister today saying they are bringing a million people home from around the world. Oh, man, yeah. This week. And it's like, Wow. Um, you know, we have Canadians all over the world, and that's just little Canada, never mind, you know, all of the other countries and people are traveling all over the world all the time. So whatever is happening in little Wuhan, China, was bound to come here. Yeah, um, yeah. And especially in the context of First Nations communities, many of our communities don't have um, really good high-quality health services. They have community level health and you know, health promotion, prevention, public health, some primary care in some of our communities that's growing all the time. But we don't have hospitals. We don't have, you know, the ability to respond with, with ICUs and ventilators and all of those kinds of things. So we really had to figure out what our role in this was yeah, and how we were going to partner with you know, the people that had the hospitals and the ICUs and um, who are doing that systemic planning around, so how do we, how do, we do this and what do we do now? Um, and because people's pandemic plans and all of the communities had one, they had a communicable disease emergency plan, yeah. but some, some of them hadn't dusted those off since 2009. Yeah, yeah, since H1N1, I think, right? Right. So, you know, the... There was a group of our, our public health response team that gathered starting the second week of January, I think, to start talking about planning and how we move forward. And that was what we called a level one response, right? Yeah, so okay. that anything in the regions could be dealt with in the regions and some central support, but not a huge amount. But then as this thing grew and as it hit BC, 
uh, we became aware that there was a significant risk to our communities. Um, our response was elevated to a level two. So every department at FNHA um, asked one of their staff people to uh, become involved in that public health response. And myself and Sonia Isaac Mann and uh, Dr. Becky Palmer, uh, who is our chief nursing officer, the three of us were put in the lead of that. Uh, level two response, and it's been busy, <laughs> holy busy. <laughs> I bet. And so now, you know, things have have increased steadily. There's been deaths in the province today. Uh, the announcement was for um, 145 new confirmed cases uh, for a total of 617, and probably a month from now, we'll think of those as small numbers. Yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing. I talked with uh, Dr. Nell Wyman, and mm. she was saying that uh, I've had her on the show a couple times, actually. She's awesome to talk with as well. And she's just, just saying, you know, this is really the beginning and people don't even know. And that was one of the things I want to talk to you about, too, is just the seriousness and how, how serious people need to take this. But, I mean, just to, just to kind of comment on some of the things you've said, I mean, you know, some of our communities are very remote, like you were saying. I mean, my community of Telegraph Creek is about seven and a half hours to the nearest hospital by driving. Right. So, yep. you know, there's no hospital, like you said. So that kind of led, lead, lead, leads me to think of some of these communities that are putting up signs and they're trying to close their communities to outside people. Now, I absolutely what, understand that response. Yeah, so I was asking, what do you think about that? Because I know you're still going to have to have whatever medical professionals are in your communities. They need to come in and out, most likely. You need resources yep. coming in and out, like fuel and food and whatnot. So how Medicine. how realistic <laughs> is that idea, right? Well, I think it's got a limited utility. Okay. It is very difficult in the world we live in now to cut yourself off completely. Even if you can provide traditional foods and foods from the land for everybody, there are so many other things that are essential services. Who's your water operator? Who's coming in and testing your water system to make sure that isn't making people sick? As you said, you know, health teams often don't live in the community. They travel in and out. Um, hydro, other utilities gasoline, food, medicine, yeah. those are all things that communities need. Um, and so there, there has to be a way to figure that out. Um, and they can do that through social distancing. I mean, that's the story we've been telling, right? Yeah. Somebody comes in to deliver to the community. Well, they drop the boxes on, on the porch of, of the band office. Somebody signs the paper and they go away. And then somebody from the community brings it inside. So there are different ways of doing this to minimize contact with the outside world. But all it takes is one person. Yeah. No, nobody in the world had immunity to this virus before it hit in um, January. Yeah. So we have an entire world population of people who are susceptible to this illness. Yeah, and you were also, one of the th things I kind of found funny was you said small little Wuhan, and Wuhan has 18 million people living there in that one okay. small well, area. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, when you look at the geography, I wasn't really talking about the people. Yeah. And they, yeah. they did an amazing job of shutting down 18 million people. Um, but they did that with military, and they did that yeah. in a very strict way. We've been struggling with some of our communities because they want to continue to have their big house ceremony. Yeah, I, yeah. I absolutely understand the desire to gather in cultural ceremony at a time when you're stressed and anxious. I can absolutely understand that. We've had people who want to hold a traditional um, funeral ceremony yeah. for somebody in the community and it's very difficult to say to people right now that's just not a good idea no yeah no doubt i i would <laughs> advise against that myself obviously if i was in my home community and they were looking at doing that i'd be like you know you just gotta talk to the family and be like you know this is not the right time to do this obviously there's a time and a place to honor the family member or the individual in your community but Right now, even that person wouldn't want that to happen, I don't think, you know. And it's 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 difficult to say and difficult to do, for sure. 
Um, Absolutely. So then, what do you, what's your thoughts on uh, like the federal government? And they haven't instituted any type of lockdown, so to speak. We've we've seen that in say mm-hmm. California or in Italy. Obviously, extreme examples. Do you think that's something that we maybe we should should consider or maybe do that sooner than what we we're not doing now because people aren't following or or taking this seriously enough, following the guidelines? I wouldn't be here today because I came over on the ferry this morning. Yeah, yeah. Cause like, I, I, I got on the ferry in my car. I stayed in my car the entire time and then came to the office, cleaned my hands, and sat down to do my work. But if we were in lockdown, I wouldn't be able to do that. So, so do you think it's something we should consider, though, just to help slow this spread? Because it doesn't seem like people are taking it serious enough. You know, I still see people gathering. I mean, in Vancouver, there's people having house parties and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And people on the beach. I mean, we saw stuff in Florida, how ridiculous that was. But like, do you think that's something we should look at seriously? Absolutely. Um, and I think it can be done gradually. Okay. So we, we know there are essential service workers out there. Yeah. I'm considered one of them. It's important for me to be able to do what I do. It's important for nurses to be able to do what they do, grocery store workers and others. Um, And we need to have, for example, daycare for people um, who are doing those things. So there are things it's very challenging to shut down. But I think the, the thought that people are immortal or immune or it isn't going to happen to me, mm-hmm. I had a, uh, I was notified by a friend on Facebook um, today that, that she and her husband and children were in the Dominican Republic on a holiday. Her husband became sick, and he's in hospital there. She and her kids are isolated in a hotel room, and they're stuck thousands of miles away from home. He's 43 years old and an athlete. I, there, there is nobody wow. who is immune. Yeah. And when we look at our, our communities, you know, the elders, the knowledge keepers, the language holders, all of um, the people with chronic disease, the diabetics and asthmatics and uh, uh, people who really struggle to stay well at the best of times. Yeah. Um, this is a real danger for them. So, it is very challenging for us to continue to communicate. No, go home and stay there. Yeah, don't, yeah. No, if you absolutely don't have to go out, don't go out. Um, you it, see, I just, it, it frustrates me to no end that there's people that don't take this seriously. I just, what do you do to those people? I would like to grab them and shake them, but I can't do that within six feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. I like that. Um, well, somebody, again, Facebook, right? Somebody said, uh, you have to stay a hockey stick away from people. Of course, And if they yeah. get closer, hit them with the hockey stick. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. But I, I think the message is starting to get through to people, and, and people are getting scared. Yeah. You know, they're hearing about people in the community who have gotten sick and gone and be tested. It's difficult because this has kind of shown up on the back of the seasonal flu. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's people still getting the flu, people get a cold, people have allergies. So there's lots of reasons people could be coughing or sneezing, um, but getting tested and knowing that you have to isolate and you can't go to work, and what is that going to do? Um, my son it works in a toy store, in a really cool toy store in Winnipeg, and, you know, they've shut the door. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they, they just can't have families and kids and everybody running around the toy store and risking infecting everybody. So, so, so I was just wondering, like, do you think, like, is this a question of, like, if, not a question of when our healthcare system is going to be just overwhelmed? Well, that's the whole concept behind flattening the curve. And yeah. you probably heard about that. And oh, people course, are kind yeah. of like, well, what does it mean? Well, if you look at, you know, the, the charts, um, there's a, a bell curve, right, yep. for any kind of an infection or outbreak. So if it it hits really quick, you get that really sharp rise and then potentially a really sharp fall. But when you have that really sharp rise, it means there's lots and lots and lots of people seeking medical care and the 
health system is overwhelmed. The concept of flattening the curve means, well, you may get it, but hopefully you'll get less of a case, and hopefully you won't get it at the same time as everybody else in your community, so that it the the need to respond is spread out. Yeah, of course. And it it never overwhelms the ability of the healthcare system to respond. You know, the hospitals in BC are doing an amazing job at freeing up hospital beds. As annoying as that is for people who have been waiting for surgery or um, other situations or, or are worried that they're being sent home too soon, we need to have somewhere to put people when they are really sick. Yeah. And so... You know, the whole system is preparing for that. They're bringing back doctors and nurses who have recently retired and relicensing them. Yes, I saw. I was reading about that. Yeah. yeah. So, so then it kind of makes me think, then why don't we just go to a full two-week lockdown just to start it off, just to slow it right away? Like, why don't we just tell everybody that's non-essential right now, you stay home for two weeks, period? Yeah, I, I can understand that people would want to do that. Getting it done is a little more complex. Yeah, I guess the devil's in the so, details, right? Yeah, and and Britain has done it, and California has done it, um, and you know there are places in Italy. All of northern Italy did it, so it, it's definitely on the table. I don't think it's off the table in terms of response discussion. Yeah, but and it's like okay, let's look and see what we've done now. Is that enough? No? Okay, then we take the next step. Because I remember a couple of weeks ago having to fight with people about canceling the Junior All-Native Festival. Oh, tournament. my goodness. Okay. Thank you. you know, for, yes, thank you for bringing that up, too, <laughs> because I was we were supposed to go cover that as a radio station. We're going to live stream it. I was going to be commentating on the games. Now, I've seen a lot of stuff on Facebook, people getting upset. And you know what? They made the right decision to to cancel it. Uh, it sucks for everybody involved. Yes. I mean, the kids have worked hard. Parents have worked fundraising. Communities have fundraised for their teams. But you know and what? People, it was the right decision to cancel it, was it not? Looking back now, oh, obviously. absolutely. People were so mad at me. So mad at me. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> but, you know, it was the same thing with Gathering Our Voices, right? Yeah, it, yeah. Kids from all over the province. And people love going to that, and they book it like a year ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. And they fundraise for it and all of those things. And then, oh, well, now we can't go because that doctor. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Shannon, this is your moment. Thank you. You were right. You were completely (laughs) right. You're vindicated that you are the hero of the day right now. You know what? I don't want to be right over other people. Yeah. I want to be able to work with people so that they understand why I'm making the recommendations I'm making. Yeah, yeah. So true. So true. So then, so now we've heard a lot of information out there just talking about the, the protocols that we would like people to do. Uh, I know FNHA, I know you had your podcast that you guys did just reiterating a lot of the stuff that we, we've, uh, you guys are promoting, but also just uh, the Canadian government, all of our healthcare officers that are out there, federal and provincial, talking about washing your hands, social distancing. But, I mean, is there anything uh, that you'd like to add to some of that stuff or just reiterate that stuff? Well, we've got a, an amazing communications team who have really sort of followed us around and said, okay, we're going to use that and that and that, and it's going to go online. So we have um, the fnha.ca forward slash coronavirus, um, and there is a, um, a wealth of information there, a uh, whole bunch of links to things like the BC Center for Disease Control um, and others. So there's really good quality um, information there. It's a good source of truth as opposed to who knows what you're reading online. And and, And we're updating it constantly. One of the frustrations people have said, this is changing all the time. This recommendation, that recommendation, it's changed. Well, it's changed because this is new and we're learning stuff every day. And when we do learn stuff, then we change it. We, you know, put something new on there um, because our knowledge has changed. Um, And so I fully recommend that people do that. There's a couple of other good sources. One is a phone line uh, in BC, 1-888-COVID-19. 
COVID-19. Um, and that's a really good source of information and an opportunity to talk to somebody um, to get more information. And if you're ill and you're not sure what to do, um, call 811. And 811, there's health professionals on the other end, and they, um, they will help you make decisions. They'll help you do a self-assessment so that you understand your responsibilities to your own health and to the health of people around you. Well, that's all fantastic information. Uh, now, I'd last, like to ask you maybe one final question is, we do know that, uh, you know, I think, like you said, it's shifting day to day. People really need to make sure that they get uh, the truthful information. Don't go on Facebook and follow your cousin's I heard post and react to that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's I, I call it social media distancing, uh, Dr. <laughs> McDonald. So people need to really respond to that and make sure they have a, a credible source. But I, I like I said earlier, I really look at people and society a lot differently. And one of the things that I feel like is... I I hope this re uh, this adjusts and shifts the paradigm for society that they look at our society and be like, why are we building huge armies when we have a healthcare system that is just being propped up so that it functions rather than being supported properly, you know? And I, I feel like it needs to be looked at a, in a different way because of, of what we're going to face in the future. It's not like this is going to be the last coronavirus or the last type of thing we face, a pandemic, you know? I feel like we need to shift our priorities, you know? But I look at frontline workers so much differently. I look at healthcare care practitioners, doctors, nurses, everyone in our supply chain that's supplying our medicine, all the food, the grocery store workers. I look at all those people so differently today than I did, uh, like I said, a week ago or 10 days ago. So I was wondering what you, if you had a message that you'd like to share to all those frontline workers, all those uh, doctors, those nurses, all those important people that are, are really our day-to-day heroes at this point. Take good care of yourselves. This is a marathon, not a sprint. We're going to be at this for a while. And you staying healthy as a healthcare worker is absolutely essential for us to be able to beat this thing and support our community. So please, please go home, take care of yourself, get rest, eat well. It sounds kind of trite, but it's absolutely essential for us to be able to move forward against this. Dr. McDonald, uh, Shannon, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I've enjoyed every second of it, and I'd love for you to come back on and uh, talk to me again. Excellent. Thanks, Ryan. I enjoyed it. And there you have it. That was my conversation with Dr. Shannon McDonald, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for the First Nations Health Authority. Just an amazing story. Thank you, Dr. McDonald, for coming on to my show and taking the time. Uh, your story is truly inspirational and amazing. And uh, FNHA is doing a fantastic job on getting information to communities, trying to find out uh, and, and up, update all the information, the latest information for all of our community members. So go to their website, fnha.ca, and you can find out more information there. You also heard Dr. McDonald mention a phone number, 1-888-COVID-19. Now that's available uh, for anyone who's looking for non-medical information about COVID-19. You can call between 7.30 a.m. and 8 p.m. seven days a week. And if you are currently sick and you do have symptoms, you're not sure what to do, call 811 that'll connect you to medical professionals and they will uh, put you through a bit of a checklist to find out what's exactly going on and they'll direct you exactly what to do so lots of uh, great stuff going on out there uh dr mcdonald again thank you so much for the job you're doing i know it's a difficult job especially right now and like you heard her say to all the medical professionals all the frontline workers take care of yourselves we need you more than ever right now it's a marathon not a sprint we are going to be dealing with this for quite some time so please take care of yourself if you have a family member that's a frontline worker please check in on them make sure that they are being taken care of as well because we need to take care of the people taking care of us too so i appreciate every single one of you especially even this, all the supply chain people, all our grocery store workers, please show them some love when you see them. Say hello. Tell them how much you appreciate the job that they are doing. And please take this seriously. I cannot stress that enough. You need to just stay at your house, stay home if it's not essential. And please do your part to help everyone involved in this. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Okay.
Let me know what you thought of today's episode. Hit me up on Facebook, CFNR Network, and leave your comments. Also, go to our website, cfnrfm.ca, and go to the App Store and download the CFNR app. That's it for me today. Till next time, let's see where the journey takes us. This has been Journeys with Ryan Frank. Join us next time for more conversations about culture and the issues affecting First Nations people in BC. Brought to you by Prince Rupert Port Authority. Linking a world of opportunity. Online, rupertport.com.